right now. So thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Mary Ann Snow and uh, I want to first of all thank our sponsors for this program, the Remote Nation Institute and SOFIA. These are organizations that are devoted to remote work and they are sponsoring this 30 minute executive briefing that we're going to be running every single Friday at um, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the situation that we're finding ourselves in. And uh, I think it's really truly an ex extraordinary time today. And for those of you familiar with what's been happening in China, as well as um, different parts of Europe, particularly France at this particular point in time, the coronavirus has certainly had a big impact on those particular areas. And both in the state of Washington, as well as um, the city of Boston, in uh, particularly in Cambridge, we've had noted cases of the coronavirus. And so COVID D is now becoming a, a topic of hot conversation. So I want to um, take you through very um, a, a very candid conversation today to talk about what's happening in terms of the coronavirus and what you need to think about in terms of workplace executive um, planning right at this particular point in time. Because as um, somebody who has launched a, a, a lot of remote work programs, I have a, a big concern with what happened at Biogen in Cambridge, Massachusetts where through no fault of their own, just by going through routine business, they have inadvertently positioned themselves for um, a, a workplace shutdown because they very innocently were involved with a, a conference which infected several of their um, staff who in turn came back to Cambridge and then infected folks within the general population at their facility in Cambridge, Massachusetts. As a result of that, Biogen has issued a complete workplace shutdown. And based on the information that we have from our healthcare providers and also our contacts within the Rhode Island government, it is quite possible that we're anticipating that other locations and other businesses, other industries are, are going to be able to expect that there might be a workplace shutdown in, in their industries uh, uh, relatively soon. And so we wanted to, to start these briefings, first of all, because we're trying to prepare you for the fact that that if your organization is forced into a work workplace shutdown, and thus your people are working from home, in the event that you do experience that shutdown, are you prepared? Do you know um, uh, how you're going to first get people out, get people home, keep people safe, but also how do you prep your business and organize your business in such a way that, that um, you can continue to operate even if you're operating in a, a remote fashion. So during our briefings, we're going to get very tactical folks. We're going to give you some very specific advice on um, things that you need to consider if there's a possibility that you might be doing a workplace shutdown, but also we want you to start using this as your checklist, your your framework for how you're going to potentially implement a mass work from home event. What are some of the operational considerations? What's the to do checklist? And how are you going to really position your folks once you have sent them home for productivity? And so over the next um, 10 weeks, we're going to be watching the situation. We're going to be thinking about um, things ahead of the curve for you. And on a weekly basis, we're going to be coming together as a group to share this information so that 
as um, the situation evolves, you have good actionable tactics that you can implement within your organization to keep ahead of the curve. So the first thing that I want to tell everybody is I, I want you to understand that this is different from a, a normal uh, remote work program. So one of the things that that I do for a living is I work with organizations to help them think about how to implement remote work as part of a larger business strategy. And I help um, my clients think about the different attributes that are associated with a, a planful remote work strategy. We're talking about job description, skill training, um, uh, different types of key performance in indicators and, and infrastructure, both technical infrastructure as well as operational infrastructure as well as the um, uh, talent management infrastructure to be able to manage things um, uh, when you have people working from homes. What we're experiencing now, what Biogen has experienced right now is a crisis situation. We're going from uh, little to no um, members of your workforce actually work from home to everyone is suddenly forced into a work from home situation and none of the planfulness exists. There is no planning whatsoever. We are in a crisis. You are literally shutting the doors and telling everybody you stay at home today. You don't come into the office and um, and now we still expect you to work. That's different than a normal remote situation, which has um, uh, certainly a more proactive strategic intent. And so everything we're talking about today is really related to a, a crisis situation where your workforce suddenly finds itself in a completely disoriented place. If you are um, in a circumstance where you have been forced into a situation where suddenly your doors are closing, then appreciate that you are not operating as a normal business. Right at this point in time, you are in a crisis situation, which means getting information out and really setting up a, a crisis infrastructure, which allows you to be able to deal with your circumstance on a minute by minute, day by day, week by week circumstance is going to be a, a major priority and a, and a, a um, something that you need to focus on first before you start thinking about um, anything beyond um, uh, what needs to happen today. And so one of the things that we've asked all of our clients to do, even if you haven't gotten into a, a complete shutdown situation, is really designate that crisis structure, which means who's going to be the decision maker during this process? Who's the, the designated crisis leader in this process? And remember, the, the crisis leader might be the one who is making decisions based on the, the data that they have as the situation evolves and unfolds. But um, that person also needs an operations team that's going to help them implement those decisions as they need to be need to be implemented. So that crisis operations team should include key business parts of your business and we're talking about security we're talking about communication we're talking about that technical infrastructure so that people can connect we're talking about the people management end of things who's going to um, uh, be in touch with your folks who's going to help them um, uh, get themselves oriented and uh, how do you start sitting up setting up the necessary framework that you need to be able to get information out um, to the folks who are working from home, but also back um, to yourself so that you know what's happening with your operation and you have um, some ability to be able to figure out, you know, just the, the, the basics because we, we have to figure out the basics now, folks. This isn't about um, doing things in a planful way. This is about really kind of set, uh, setting up a crisis command set, center. 
operational structure, infrastructure for a, a mass remote work event is going to be based on your particular current situation. And this is going to be really, really important because if you have not deployed a remote work force before, then appreciate that um, you may not have some of the, the technical capabilities. You may not have the inventory of devices. You may not have the sort of basic HR framework to be able to manage one of these things. And so again, we're in triage mode, which means as we go through and we talk today, I want you to really start um, uh, making a list for yourself and, and be honest about where you are now versus where you could be if um, you needed to close your doors tomorrow. And then remote work access and pro process. So, you know, um, you know, that whole piece of if you are trying to maintain your business because there are things that you can do in the event that there is a shutdown, then you're going to have to think about not only the technical aspects of being able to do that work, but also the physical aspects of, of being able to do that work. And there are some things that that um, need to be taken into consideration on both sides of um, uh, those things. And then, and then further down the road, and this is something that we'll continue to talk about as um, we have our briefings, we're gonna talk about also the re-entry plan. How do you bring people back in at the end of this? Because you know this is, uh, this is gonna be unprecedented in ways that we can't possibly imagine. So for all of um, you who are bumping into remote work for the very first time, here's your initial checklist that I absolutely want to focus on today because these are things that you need to get in place as fast as possible in order for you to be able to move things forward. Obviously, we talked about a chain of command and we're gonna talk about that in just a little more depth because I wanna take you through the list of the attributes that that, that chain of command structure should have. Technical access, access um, uh, you know, do people have technical access to the things, the systems, the information, um, uh, the work um, files, everything that they need to be able to do their job. But then you also need access to resources. And so resource might be, um, geez, you know, I have a big project going on and in order for me to do that project, I need access to this um, expertise and this expertise or this expertise. But it might also mean that it, it is uh, a resource access to a system, it might be resource access to information, it could be resource ac access to an actual physical location. It's like, how do you how do you navigate these things? What are some of the security and the risks that are associated with this type of extraordinary event? We've got a list for you to, to think about and also something for you to focus on as you're going through this process. And then how are you going to keep the information flowing, both internally within your team itself, as well as externally, that external communication protocol that you're going to use not only to let your customers, your suppliers, um, uh, your vendors, all the people that you're working with externally know your current state, um, what you're capable of, all of that sort of stuff, but also um, in the event that there's some sort of a reputational um, uh, event that you have to manage. So we'll talk about all of those things. So as I mentioned, this is a crisis circumstance. The clear chain of command has to be a priority for you. And not only are we talking about appointing a crisis leader, someone who's a decision maker, but also someone who can calm the waters because um, people are gonna be unnerved if you suddenly have to shut their doors. There's gonna be a lot of emotion around it. They are not gonna know how to proceed. And um, if you don't have somebody who is clearly the voice of authority, then that means that um, the individuals within your organization are, are gonna struggle with the fact that 
that they're not sure who's calling the shots and you want to make sure that everyone understands who's calling the shots. And this has been um, uh, particularly interesting for some of our clients who are healthcare in the healthcare industry right at this particular point in time, because obviously um, you have people who are making decisions at a fairly rapid rate. And so we've been working with um, different hospital groups that are um, making um, very, what seem to be quite severe choices quite um, uh, uh, rapidly right at this particular point in time. And, the t and over time, that the um, the trajectory of this crisis will tell us whether those decisions were hasty or whether these people were um, uh, very smart. And it's hard to know until we have a chance to go down the road. But someone has to make decisions and they have to make decisions as fast as possible. Remember that you need an operations team to surround the crisis leader because that ops team is going to be responsible for implementing those business Business critical functions. It might be um, uh, deploying laptops to uh, business critical members of the team. It might be um, uh, collecting data and keeping an eye on um, certain media streams, or it could be keeping an eye on the CDC website, or it could be keeping an eye on what's happening at the local level in terms of um, what is your local um, government asking you to do. And so that crisis op teams is collecting data, they're, they're listening, they're helping keep eyes on critical parts of, of the project, as well as implementing decisions once they're made. And while the leader might decide based on data, remember, if the leader doesn't have data, then it's gonna be harder for them to decide, but the team, has to come together in such a way that that they are backing that leader and making sure that that once um, a, a decision is made that they're working in unison to be able to implement whatever the plan is that's been decided on. Now, if you're experiencing a workplace shutdown, appreciate that that technical access is going to fall into lots of different categories. We're talking about devices. We're talking about the internet. We're talking about systems. We're talking about systems that, that may have to do with not only things like sharing work files, but it might be access to a business critical system, which allows people to be able to say, file payroll for you on a weekly basis or be able to um, uh, issue invoices um, uh, or be able to collect revenue, which are mission critical things because right at this point in time, if you have a business interruption, you're going to have to um, account for your cash flow at this point in time. What's your current cash position? Um, uh, what do you have? Not only um, that you can bill, but what, that you can collect so that you can maintain your financial position. And then in addition to that, you also have to think about, you know, um, what kind of work do you do and can you continue in some fashion for as long as possible so that you can keep the doors open and, and keep the business running. And then, you know, if you have technology, who's going to support that technology? This is not a time to be adopting a whole bunch of new software. We're asking all of our clients right now to do a quick inventory of what they have that they've already paid for that some people have used in their organizations and we're asking them to really kind of focus on that technology because people within their organization might at least have a modicum or or a basic understanding of how that technology technology works. This is going to be important because folks who are in this circumstance are already discombobulated um, our our um, clients who have um, made choices to shut down are already trying to um, figure out what's possible and what's not possible at this point in time. Everyone's a little disoriented. And so um, the more that we can fall back on things that people have actually used in the past, the better off you're going to be. The other thing is we're asking our clients to do um, device inventories right now so that you have a clear sense of how many laptops do you have? 
Um, how many tablets do you have? Um, how many um, company owned cell phones do you have? If you have limited amounts of devices, then our recommendation to our clients at this point is to take that inventory and, and deploy it to the most business critical functions so that at least um, some of your functions you absolutely know are going to be covered. And then um, just, just accept the fact that it's highly likely that your, your people are probably going to be using some of their own devices. And that means that we have security considerations that we need to be concerned with. The other thing that we're asking people to think about is, you know, what are the job tools that people will need in order for them to be able to not only um, uh, complete the work that they have to complete, but um, uh, so that they could also complete the mission critical functions that will allow you to be able to keep your business running as um, close to normal as possible. And as I mentioned, things like how do you run a payroll? How do you do deposits? How do you collect revenue? Um, but also, um, how do you deliver services? For one of our clients, which is a, a, a national company that, that does um, remote bookkeeping, this is a company that was actually built um, for a situation where um, uh, remote work is uh, an advantage. And in their particular case, one of the things that they found is that while their job tools and their infrastructure is totally in place, they've had to really kind of um, retool themselves right now because um, the folks that they're working with, their clients are less remote than they are. And so for them, they are actually doing tutorials on how to work remotely with many of their clients who are finding themselves uh, a little bit unnerved and a, and a little bit um, um, really uh, scrambling in because of some of the things that are happening right at this particular point in time. So um, tools, job tools, um, how do you have access to people who've got expertise, particularly on the IT side, but I would also argue on the, on, um, the HR side, on the operations side, on um, uh, pretty much administration side, any part of your operations. It's like, how can you connect people so that they're going to be able to help each other? How do you get access to information? What are the priorities? What are you asking people to do? How long is it going to last? Um, um, what um, are the requirements? How are you going to hold people accountable? All of these things are big questions that, that people are struggling with. And so we're asking folks to really kind of take stocks and take inventory so that um, if and when you had to do a workplace shutdown, that your priorities are already set. And then you know, in these circumstances, as we said, if your um, uh, workforce is not a, a remote work enabled workforce, appreciate that right at this particular moment, you have to um, determine the critical security implications for your organization if your employees go remote appreciate that we're not just talking about buildings, although we might be talking about buildings in the sense that if you actually own an office building or you own some sort of a structure, um, who's going to take care of that building? How is it going to be manned um, in, in a, a particular time period, regardless of how, how long um, this shutdown continues? But also, you know, um, what's the data associated with this data security if people are using their own personal devices are you more prone to attack if you are adopting new tools um, say for example zoom um, we happen to be using a microsoft teams platform because many of our clients are in office 365 shop um, uh, Office 365 as well as Teams were built with security features in mind. Um, Zoom is more of an open platform and there have been um, some concerns in the past about 
uh, security issues with Zoom, and it will remain to be seen if we're seeing those security, security issues raise their head as people are using Zoom in the future. And then um, don't forget, you also have a workforce that's that's actually now at home, which means who do you keep in the office? Who do you have at home? Are those people working safe? If um, there's an, you know, any sort of a, a circumstance that occurs when people are at home, how are they um, maintaining their own safety and their own security within um, the confines of their house? So these are things that we want you to think about. There are also um, communication um, issues that are pretty prevalent right at this point in time. And the first thing that we're asking all of our clients to think about, and you know, we're working with a, a large um, uh, national retail chain. It's a hearing aid distributing company that is located all up and down the eastern seaboard. And um, we've been working with them now for uh, uh, almost six years. And so we've done a lot of virtual stuff, which means they have routine um, uh, virtual staff meetings and they have routine um, live stream virtual conferences. And so they're pretty, pretty familiar with this stuff, which means they can leverage that technical infrastructure in ways that many people can't because they have um, cameras in all their locations. They've got um, uh, uh, the video platform tools in place, all of this stuff in place so that so that we can get messages out to folks in a very short period of time. If this is something new to you, then you're going to have to come up with a, a short term solution. And so what we're asking our clients to do at this moment, even some of our small clients who are who are not on video yet, who aren't um, actually thinking about these things to do things like collect everybody's cell phone number so that you could potentially do a um, distribution list to every so that you could text out to everyone just so that that everybody understands that that there's an event that's happening that that um, uh, they should be aware of and they have the information that they need so that they can participate in that event. Use whatever tools and system are already in place. If you've got cell phones in place, leverage the cell phones. If you've got laptops in place, then um, uh, leverage the laptops. If you don't have any of that in place, then get on the phone and um, make phone calls to people. Go old school. One of the things that we did with one of our clients was we asked them to actually set up a call tree network, which means you know we have team members who are inaccessible, who don't have access to um, the internet at this moment, but they have um, phone connectivity. And so we have team leaders who have um, team leads who are calling, the team leader calls the two team leads and the team leads call their list. And so you have a call tree that allows you to be able to cascade information out to every person on the team because someone is responsible for calling the next person on the list. And so as long as everybody fulfills their obligation and responsibility, you can get information out as fast as possible. You want to create an escalation list to um, resolve issues fast. And, and this is very simply kind of tied into that crisis network. If you have a crisis leader and you have a crisis op team, then part of what you're doing with that internal communication is you're letting people know who to contact if they have a particular problem. Who's the IT contact if they're having system problems? Who is the um, HR contact if they have concerns about benefits or, or whatever? Um, uh, who is the person that they contact in the event that there's um, some sort of an issue? And then how do you actually look at all of the channels that you have available within your um, portfolio of, of technology tools and devices and, and even old school um, um, methods of, of contacting people? And then assign specific work functions to those particular channels. If you're using text distribution lists, 
then what are you using that for? It shouldn't be for everything. It should be for very specific things. If you've got um, video capabilities, why are you doing video conferencing? If you have email, um, what are you using that email for? Um, are you setting up distribution lists? Are you doing phone trees? Um, how are you going to get information out to the field, but also back from the field so that there's a good communication flow both down and up? And then how do you create a decentralized messaging network across the groups to deputize point people to push messages out? And this is part of that um, call tree strategy. Um, Any time that you've got a, a sudden remote workforce, we we had to deploy. Um, you know, if we're working with our insurance company and we have four thousand people in the in the organization, if that organization has to go um, uh, remote, that's four thousand people. And um, every single person may not have access to every single one of the channels yet. And so how are you decentralizing that message and using that call tree format in order to be able to get information out to people, but ensuring that someone is deputized to move that message forward so that so that there is um, a, 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 a free flow of information. Don't forget your external communication um, protocols as well. And that's talking about things like, okay, um, you know, if you're a service company, we have, have clients who are service co companies that are already contracted for services. Um, how are we going to get the message out to our clients? Um, you know, we're asking our customers um, right now. Um, to really kind of give us a, a status of what we can best do to be able to serve them. And we're doing that by having our team member who is closest to that client talk to their contacts within the organization. So it's a people to people um, conversation so that we're understanding what, what our clients need from us right now, but our clients also understand what we what our capabilities and capacity is right now. So the more that we can connect with our clients by having the people most familiar with that client reach out to that that person so that there's a, a good free flow of information, the better off you're going to be. And then, you know, this is a, a great opportunity to have that employee take on responsibility for sticking close to that client so that the client hears from a familiar voice, so that they already have an established relationship, so that there it's much more likely that you're going to get get um, a clear sense of what's happening with that client and vice versa because they're not feeling like they're talking to a stranger. How do you set up that communication tree system with your external people just like um, you're setting it up with your internal people so that you can keep people connected and get messages out fast? You know, setting up different types of segmented distribution lists. If you've already got um, newsletters in place, if you've already got a, a communication team that um, has routine contact with folks, how do you um, marshal those and and really commandeer them for um, the crisis situation? So um, with that, um, uh, these are are things that we're asking our um uh that we're asking our clients to do right now these are our things that we think are really important um factors that um our folks should be thinking about at this particular moment and at this moment what i'd like to do is i'd like to open it up to the group and see if we have any questions and if you have a question for me if you can do me a favor and just indicate in the chat that you have a specific question and i'll invite you into the conversation and we'll see if we can give you great information that will be helpful to you so um, uh, if anybody has a chat and they want to just indicate Great. Um, uh, Kimberly Marin. Marion. Hey, Marion. Um, so I was thinking about two questions. Um, 
how do we keep this is a little different than a technical question, but how do we keep teams motivated? You know, I'm trying to do a little bit of, you know, exciting a few little videos and things, but is there a good way to kind of keep people motivated? We're all stuck in our individual spots thinking about, you know, what we can do around the house. I want to keep people motivated. Yeah, and I think um, right at this particular point in time, Kim, the first thing that I would say is is um, um, keeping people motivated at this moment really has to do with they're anxious, they're worried, they're concerned, they're discombobulated, and they're and they're kind of messed up at the moment. So the the more that you can um, organize yourself around, um, uh, you know, a, a, a very predictable. Um, uh, framework for communication, particularly your internal folks. What can they expect? Who do they talk to about stuff? What's the current circumstance? What are their priorities? Who's in charge? Who's calling right. the shots? The more that you can ask those questions, I think answer those questions, the better off you're going to be at this particular point in time. Once you get to that point, then um, the great part about it is once you calm everybody down, then we can actually start getting a little creative about um, different ways that we can keep people engaged. And um, uh, in future briefings, we'll definitely be having conversations around that. OK, so setting up good structure is going to be super important. Thank you. Yeah, and you said you had a second question. Oh, I do. Um, you mentioned the personal devices. I do. Um, I think that's going to be an issue, and I'm sure you'll touch on it later. But is there anything I can do early on to make sure personal devices are protected or secure? Yeah, this is a, a really important thing, and um, we're going to talk about this in our next briefing, but I'll give you a little insight into that. One of the things we're asking all of our clients to do right now is, you know, if they're asking people to use their personal stuff, um, uh, first of all, um, we're, we're saying to people with your personal things, the first thing is, um, are they actually using some sort of security, right? Um, get them loaded with um, whether it's Norton antivirus, whether it's Webrew, um, uh, whether it's whatever, you know, look out on phones, but get get um, cell phones and get um, all um, personal devices loaded with some sort of antiviral software. That's like um, basic, basic, basic to start. And um, uh, if you, I'm going to invite you back to our, our next um, briefing because we're going to go through the security checklist for some of the other considerations for personal devices. But very big thing right now. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Yupong, Yupong Chen, did you have a question? Yes, yes, Mary, I have a question. So my, my question is uh, um, because we don't use use video conferencing before and um, what was a unique advantage of using a video conferencing and uh, especially compare with some old school method like a phone call or other things yeah and i think that's a great question um yupong and and one of the the things that we um all of our clients when we work with our clients we we um ask them to transition to video conferencing and and one of the reasons we do that Yupong is because um, with video conferencing there's actually um, a visual presence if you are relying solely on digital communications with remote workforce part of the problem is is people are going to lose their humanity they're going to feel very isolated particularly in a, cir a circumstance where you've got people who are working who are suddenly working from home, who are unfamiliar with that territory. They're used to being in an office. They're used to seeing other folks. They're already disoriented. They're already feeling uncomfortable. They're already worried and scared. To Kim's point, it's like, how do you um, pull them back together? How do you engage them? How do you get them on the same page? Um, and there's something really powerful about seeing someone's face. And so um, video conferencing adds the body language. It gives them tone of voice. And while you get some of that by the phone, um, uh, this is a much richer form of communication. And so um, get video into um, the mix. And and when you come back um, to, I'm going to invite you to come back to some of our other briefings. We're going to talk more about the power of video and, and um, the advantage of video. 
All right. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, uh, Kate, do I have a Kate? Kate, do you have a question? Yes, um, we don't have enough laptops to go around. We still use desktops in some cases. So um, how should we address this going forward? Thanks very much, Kane. I think that's um, pretty typical for a lot of businesses. We have um, um, uh, many businesses right now. Um, most of our clients, when we start working with them, don't have enough um, technology to de deploy every single person that's sitting on their staff. But um, one of the things I will say to you is there's someone in your office right now, someone in your business who has worked on the road, who's worked, um, uh, you know, um, uh, off site for some reason or other. And so there's probably some kind of devices someplace we're asking our clients to to take inventory of those devices and then put them in the hands of really business critical functions. So the the critical business functions that are going to need those devices, you know, people who have to handle cash for you. If you have um, some device that's been set up by your company, that's going to be um, a, a, a much better person to have that um, a laptop than say some senior executive who uses it but doesn't um, use it to the high volume that um, uh, somebody in that mission critical position is in. So um, think about, you know, who's going to be closest to the money, right? Who's going to be closest to the money? Who's going to be closest to the data? Get them um, what you can and then um, uh, if you have any old equipment, time to recycle it. If you have any new equipment that hasn't been deployed, time to um, deploy it. And then um, just like with Kim's question, with any um, data, any um, device that you're, you're um, trying to get people on, make sure that they get um, good um, security on that that stuff. Make sure that, that all the updates have happened, that everything is up to date, and that you also have antiviral, malware, and all of those things in place. Thank you. Um, uh, Steve Bautista. Steve Bautista, do you have a question? Oh, I do, Marianne. Hi. Um, you know, given that we're in um, a very chaotic time and people have their own situations uh, different staff members have separate uh, situations at home. Should we try to keep regular office hours as much as possible, or should we be a little bit more flexible on that one? Um, great question, Steve. Um, you know, first of all, I think that um, it's going to take a week or so. The dust has to settle, settle, right? Right at this point in time, I would say that um, I would character, character, um, I would characterize the current state as um, pretty much a state of of chaos and discombobulation. People are, you know, um, do they shut down? Don't they shut down? What's happening? Um, is this a problem? Isn't this a problem? Um, and so one of the things that, that I would say at this point, Steve, is, is trying to maintain your normal office structure right at this particular point in time should you have bigger priorities to deal with. And um, uh, the more that you can figure out the current circumstance in relation to, do you have to um, have a shutdown? Do you need to deploy people? What does that look like? What's possible? Um, I would say you should be prepared to potentially do some nights and weekends if that's what what is going to prep you for what's coming next, whatever that might be. Um, uh, you know, let's let's just take care of um, the crisis situation first, allow um, uh, your organization to take stock and and then figure out what makes sense from a, um, a work perspective. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Kyle, do you have a question? Yeah, I had a question regarding uh, stemming from keeping up employee morale. So one of the ways that you typically will do that is uh, in person, you'll go to a happy hour or things like that. But I know like you see a lot of people having virtual happy hours. Um, I was wondering like, are there other activities that you've heard of or could suggest to 
uh, be able to kind of keep that employee engagement and uh, FaceTime up? Yeah, and um, Kyle, that's a really good question. And and as somebody who's actually been working remotely um, uh, since the 1990s, I can tell you that um, uh, that um, there are so many ways to connect with people. And the fact that um, the technology has evolved enough that you can very cost effectively get onto video conferencing and um, be able to bring people together. We used Microsoft Teams not only because we, we do some partnership work with Microsoft, but also because we're trying to highlight these platforms because a lot of people are not familiar um, with different types of video platforms. Video is nice because, I mean, you know, um, you're able to physically see people, which is great. But I could give you um, examples of many, many, many um, different ways that our clients over the years have um, figured out ways to um, build in a, a little bit of levity, a little bit of um, team engagement. And this kind of goes back to Kim's question. Um, I've, you know, I have um, clients who have actually done, um, you know, uh, ice cream socials, um, uh, they do book groups, uh, mm. they, uh, I have a, um, an international, I have a client who has an international team, and they always do a video conference, and the new person has to, has to do a house tour, you know, oh. so um, uh, they have to pick up their, their device, and they have to show them around um, their workspace, and so, um, all of these sorts of things are on the table. Um, I'm going to invite you back to, to future briefings where if this continues, we'll definitely talk about different ways to engage. Um, uh, but there are so many cool ways that you can do that with people nowadays. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, uh, Chi Bing, Chi Bing Yi, you have a question? Hi, Mary. Yes, I do. Um, actually, so imagine if the workplace shut down suddenly, and then what do you um, suggest about the current and uh, ongoing hiring and onboarding activities? Like for our organization, we, for example, we need to set up the computer and then set up a lot of accounts for them when they are onboarding in them. Would you, any suggestion about those situations? Yeah, um, Chi Bing, that's a really good question, and and um, you know one of the things that we're going to talk about in um, a, a couple of briefings in the future briefings is we're going to talk about you know what is business as usual. Usual, how do you prioritize um, what's important and what's not important? And so the the thing that you don't want to do with a new hire is if you're committed to that person and you need that person, they're a mission critical person for you you um, don't want them to get lost in the shuffle. And so somebody has to be assigned to their onboarding. Um, uh, they, they actually have to have responsibility for that. And so the more you can um, uh, give that person, that new person, a mentor, the more you can um, uh, really give them some sort of a, a framework. The one thing that, that I will absolutely say to all of you is that remote work is not something that you can do ad hoc. It's something that um, requires planning. You need to put some forethought into it. And I want to remind you that um, our current state is not um, planned for remote work. This is kind of, you know, crisis situation. So um, in this circumstance, I would say you absolutely, um, if that person is critical to your business, make sure someone's dedicated to them so that they're not feeling like they fell through the cracks. Okay. Thanks. That's helpful. Thank you. Jure, um, uh, do I have, um, Jure, do you have a question for me? Yes. Thank you, Mary, for the presentation. So, um, how long do you think this situation will last? Well, um, uh, based on um, uh, our um, knowledge of some of the things that happened in China uh, and also um, some of the trajectory that we see in Europe right now, particularly in France, um, I think it's uh, uh, too early to tell, but I think people should be planning for the worst. And so um, our, our advice to all of our clients right now is to set yourself up so that you are prepared 
and it may feel like you're over preparing right at this point in time, but that means you'll be ahead of the curve. And if you have to have to pull back on your planning, that will be a lot easier than trying to play catch up later on. So um, uh, we, we're asking people to really think about the best ways to position themselves for, um, uh, you know, whatever comes and um, assume that they may have to uh, accommodate a workplace place shut down for a period of time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So um, folks, we're very conscious of your time. I actually think I, I ran a little over 30 minutes, but I think with this particular briefing, I think it's really important that we, we get the word out and we give you very specific information so that you can prep for what's coming. Um, we know that the situation is going to be evolving. And so um, the reason that we're committed to doing these um, executive briefings on a weekly basis is to ensure that every single week you have up-to-date information that is um, coming from people who understand remote work, who understand how to not only manage these situations, but how to get good team productivity and and help you be able to maintain your operational structure during this time period. So we welcome you. We hope you come back and join us again. And we want to thank you so much um, for joining us today. So um, take care, be well, and uh, we hope to see you again next Friday. Bye-bye.